Once upon a time, there was a huge fire in the forest, and all the animals come out and are watching their home burn. And they're all so overwhelmed and feel so hopeless, all of them except for this little hummingbird, who says, I'm going to do something about it. So it flies as fast as its little wings can carry it to a stream, and it picks up a drop of water. And it flies back as fast as it can, and it puts it on the fire. And the hummingbird goes back and forth, back and forth, as fast as its little wings can carry it. Meanwhile, all the other animals, much bigger animals, like an elephant that has a big trunk and could carry so much more water, are standing there, helpless, doing nothing. And they say to the hummingbird, this fire's too big and you're too little. Your beak is so small and your wings are so small. What difference can you make? And as they're continuing to discourage it, the hummingbird, still going back and forth as fast as it can, stops, looks at them, and says, I'm doing the best that I can. I'm doing the best that I can. That's my favorite story. It reminds me that while I may sometimes and often feel insignificant, I don't want to be like the other animals watching as their homes burn. I want to be like that hummingbird every day, and I'm sure most of you do too. I first heard that story being told by Wangari Matai, and many of you may know her. She, is, or she was a, a uh, Kenyan environmentalist who founded the Green Belt Movement, um, which is a conservation and women's rights organization. And for her efforts, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and was the first woman from Africa to, to be awarded it. When I hear her tell that story, the story itself and the way she tells it makes me think about my choices, my behavior, and ultimately, my existence. It makes me think about who I am as an individual and what it means to be human. I'm sure you all have favorite stories too, a favorite one, one that may have been told to you when you were a little kid or one you've seen or read about. Stories are, are, are everywhere. We're, we're born into stories. There are stories told about us even before we're born. We read stories to our children, we see them on the news, we read them in books, on our social media feed, in blogs, memes, they're everywhere. We heard some just now. We're hardwired for stories because it's how we make sense of the world. And we've been telling them since the dawn of our existence, from early cave paintings that depicted the trials and tribulations of human life to the latest episode on Netflix of Emily in Paris. Stories have been critical for our human evolution and our survival. And for me, this feels more important now than ever. The story of the hummingbird moves me because stories have power. They have the power to move us from a position of paralysis and fear to one of courageous hope and action. Stories are our real-life superpower. In our hyper-connected world, we're constantly being bombarded with doom and gloom and catastrophe scenarios, and so it's really easy to feel like those animals in the forest helpless, like you can't do anything. But we need the power of stories now more than ever to help us rethink realities, imagine what is possible in order to overcome the existential crises that we face. So storytelling isn't just communications. It isn't a fad, it's not something new, it's something that we've been doing since the dawn of our existence. And the best part is it's something that we all can do. We're all storytellers. So what is it that makes stories so, so powerful? Here's what happens to your brain when you listen to a story. When you're listening to a story, your brain is coupling with the person that's telling the story, so it's actually feeling like it's experiencing what's being described. So you might think of yourself first as the helpless elephant and say, okay, I don't like that, and then imagine yourself as the hummingbird, and in your brain, you're going back and forth, back and forth, carrying those drops of, of water, and then you might relate that story to your own life. Through a process known as neural coupling, your brain is lighting up as if you're actually experiencing those activities themselves. 
So stories, in a way, are the original metaverse without technology because they enable us to experience things that we may never have been and to take us on journeys in places that we've never been to before. The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle once said that in order to have communications that can persuade, they needed to contain three rhetorical elements. Logos, facts, ethos, the credibility of the person telling the story, and pathos, the emotional element. Brain science shows us that when we listen to facts, maybe two parts of our brain are lit up, so sometimes we forget facts, um, and that's one of the reasons why. But when we listen to a whole story, our whole entire brain lights up. So if we combine facts and stories together, it's not an either or, but it's an and, we can really have an impact. It's also really important when we're thinking about storytelling to think about how we're telling stories and how they're framed. And here I want to talk about hope. Hope is the ability to imagine a different reality and a belief that it's possible. Hope is a very powerful emotion because the process of imagining a different reality can help us to take steps to make that happen. Fear has the opposite effect. When we hear a story that makes us feel fearful, we shut down. Our brains are hardwired for our own safety and security. An ac academic study a few years ago found that the more negative people felt after consuming a news story, the less likely they were to take action to make the world a better place. So we really need to think about the role of hope and fear and what that means when we're talking about some of the key challenges that we face as humanity today. So if storytelling is so powerful, what does it mean to tell stories for good? What does, what does that look like? I see this a lot in the work that I do at the Peace Talks, which is a platform that showcases inspirational stories of people who are making a contribution to peace. It's really easy with today's headlines to just see war, to see the pe or to feel that peace is not possible or it's a faraway dream. But by showcasing real people who are making a real difference in their communities, we're trying to show that a different reality is possible. We featured many inspirational individuals, and one of them I want to tell you about is Yasminko. Yasmiko grew up in his hometown of Sarajevo during the war, so he, he experienced his childhood in, during war. And after the war, he, he was curious about how other children had experienced war. So he launched a crowdsourcing project. And through this crowdsourcing project, he asked people to relay their stories and experiences of what it was like to grow up in war. And he got a lot of entries, so many so in fact that he created a book. And actually then turned this book into the world's only museum that's dedicated to the experience of childhood in war. So while many of us here today have never experienced a war, let alone being a child in war, if you go to this museum and you see the artifacts in the museum like teddy bears and the stories that are related to them of these children, you might be able to access and understand these children's fears, hopes, and dreams. Yasminko understood the power of stories and so can we. I see this also a lot in the work that I do with the New Humanitarian. It's a nonprofit newsroom, and we're reporting on humanitarian crises. And we're constantly thinking about how we're telling the stories and how to create an emotional connection with the people that we're telling stories about, because we're telling stories and, and producing journalism about crises, hunger, disaster, uh, war. And we're thinking also about how the people in those places want their stories to be told. If I tell you that 270 million people are at risk of acute food shortages or that 216 million people are going to be internally displaced because of the impacts of climate change, you might say, whoa, that's, that's a lot, that's terrible. But then, a few minutes later, you haven't made a connection. But if you read about a story about, for example, we did a, ran a story about the collapse of Lebanon, which also is very hard to grasp as an outsider, but if you read the story told through the WhatsApp messages of five people, that might give you something more to think about. People in crises are often anonymous. They're, they're refugees, they're victims, they're survivors, there's people in need. When we think about the crises that we face, we often give labels to people who are at risk, underprivileged, and using this language can have a negative effect in terms of stigmatizing uh, people who are actually at most at, at risk. We have a habit of seeing and defining people by deficits, by looking at the problem, 
or seeing it, them as uh, the problem. Author Chimamanda Adichie warns us of the danger of a single story. The more we show people as one thing, the more that they become that. The opposite of this, this, is, this, this notion is called deficit framing, is something that author Trabian Shorters pioneered that's called asset framing. And it's seeing the dream before the problem. It's seeing the hummingbird doing the best that it can instead of seeing a tiny animal that probably can't make much of a difference by itself. But it has courageous hope. It's doing its best. We need to tell more hopeful stories and see our dreams before our problems. So I'd like to ask all of you today to think about hopeful stories and why they make you hopeful. And I'd like to encourage you to tell them, to share them, and repeat them. We need to see our dreams before our problems in order to have the impact that we need to make to make our world a better place. You too are a storyteller, and you have that superpower. And maybe, if there are enough hummingbirds in the world, we'll put out some of our fires. Thank you.